Welcome to Getting Started with Woody Ornamentals. Um, joined today with Molly Schindler from Eck Collective Farm in CSA, based in Mechanicsville, and we're gonna talk about a woody ornamental project that we have been working on together with a few other producers here in um, East Central Iowa on developing a woody ornamental production on their farms. Uh, a couple just Zoom housekeeping things before we get started. You're all muted um, coming in, and um, and uh, I will wield my supreme power as Zoom host to mute as needed throughout the presentation. Um, but uh, if you have questions throughout, um, just ask to use the the chat function for now. And I think towards the end we can do a Q and A where you can unmute and ask them. Um, but I'll keep an eye on the chat box, and I can interrupt. Molly as we go along um, with any questions. Um, for those that are less familiar with Zoom, if you hover along the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a chat icon, you just click that and then you can, um, you can type in there and I'll just keep an eye on that. Um, we are recording this, uh, so if you wanna catch it again later on or review anything we talked about, it will be available um, through our website and I think we'll dive right in. So just briefly here, uh, I'm Jay Kundert. I guess I forgot that part. I'm Jay Kundert. I'm the Food Systems Director with the Iowa Valley RCND. We're a nonprofit based out of Amana. And uh, our mission is to enhance quality of life for Iowans by strengthening food systems, leading collaborative placemaking projects, and bringing technical assistance to rural communities. Um, and a lot of our work fits into these four sectors of community, food, farm, and environment. And this Woody Ornamental project fit in well uh, with a couple of those sectors in terms of, um, we, I'll talk a little, bit, a little more about this in a second, but we saw an opportunity through Woody Ornamentals to potentially add an, another enterprise onto uh, diversified direct market farms here in our region um, and potentially across Iowa and the Midwest. And we wanted to explore that uh, with some farm partners. And uh, we just kind of see this as a way where we can help kind of catalyze a, a growth in a segment of the food system. So some more about the trial that we're working on. Uh, the main goal here is to develop production systems in Iowa um, around woody ornamentals and to assess market potential for these crops and, and where they would be sold to um, uh, in the market. Um, and the, there's a kind of a, a number of kind of concepts that we wanted to look at with this project. We knew that we could grow these crops in Iowa and we knew that they weren't fully being, um, utilized within the marketplace, um, and, and, and grown on farms here in the region. So we wanted to see, um, you know, both how they would fit into farms, um, diversified direct market produce farms here in Iowa. Um, and to explore some of these other opportunities that might come from woody ornamentals on farms. So um, a lot of these types of species, uh, uh, dogwoods and willows in particular, are uh, native to Iowa. And we know they have a lot of important value as habitat for beneficial insects um, and wildlife. So we wanted to see if there's a way where there could be a balance between production and market value to the farms, but also have some of those additional benefits. Um, pussy willows, for instance, are one of the first crops to bloom, or first plants to bloom in the spring. And so they're really important pollinator um, uh, food for um, uh, in, in, the, in the region. After a long winter, they're kind of running out of their, their food storage. Um, we saw it as a, it could be an important perennial crop that could balance some of the more intensive um, annual crops that are grown on many of these farms. Um, we saw it as it fitting into a specific window of production. So it, it, uh, are, they're primarily harvested in the fall to winter um, once the plants have fully defoliated. And so we saw that as kind of being an opportunity both with the farmer's time of having that be a little more of the kind of downtime if there really is one on farms. Um, so my, farmers might have more time to, to harvest at that point in time and also have more cash flow at that point in time. And then just kind of broadly, woody ornamentals, how we are 
talking about them. We're mostly talking about those that are harvested as more of a decorative branch once the plants have defoliated um, after a couple hard frosts. But there are, and so those mostly include for our project, dogwoods and willows. Um, and there are a number of varieties that we'll talk about within those kind of big two species groups. Um, but woody ornamentals as a, a whole kind of crop also include things like lilacs and uh, hydrangeas and viburnum, um, forsythia, things that are even harvested during kind of that main production season and, and sold for their flowers. Um, but for this project, we mostly worked within those kind of decorative branch um, segment of the crop. Um, this project was all funded through a specialty crop block grant um, from the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship. And we uh, worked with seven farms here, mostly in kind of Lynn Johnson County, um, also some in Iowa and, well, are you in Cedar or Jones? I'm in Cedar County. There you go. Um, and these are all mostly small to medium scale farms. Like I said, they sell mostly direct to consumer and are producing primarily fruits and vegetables and some cut flowers. The growers that we worked with, uh, we got funding through the grant where we could help purchase uh, a certain amount of, of planting stock and let the growers really decide what they wanted to grow. Um, so it's mostly, as I mentioned, red uh, dogwoods and, and willows. Um, Within dogwoods, it's really mostly red, red twig dogwood, and then but there's a whole um, slew of willow options that are really cool um, for, for floral arrangements. So they are mostly characterized by having either a really cool color or a cool shape. So curly willows kind of have like a, a curly cue look to them. There's yellow and red and darker colors of green and, and uh, brown. Um, and, and then within the pussy willows, they're what the, the kind of attractiveness of them as a crop is these little catkins, which is kind of the early bloom of the, of the willow. Um, and that is what has that kind of pollinator food. Um, but they're just kind of these little cool tufts of, of white that uh, are kind of the first blooms of the plant in the spring. Um, all of the planting stock with this project, we did uh, bare root, um, unrooted cuttings and rooted cuttings, and then um, some potted plants as well. And those were all purchased from um, uh, a couple different uh, vendors, Bailey's Nursery in Minnesota, Double A Vineyards in New York, Cold Stream Farm in Michigan, and then as well as uh, just cuttings from local farms that had varieties that we were interested in. And Molly can talk a little bit more about that. Um, on my end of the things, I, I spent a lot of time trying to research where we could get these types of uh, planting stock. And it's, there's not a ton of options, to be honest. Um, if places like Bailey's or larger nurseries ha have those varieties that are more grown for their, their kind of um, visual characteristics that can be used in floral uh, arrangements, um, but you really need to reach a certain uh, uh, quantity for them to do business with you. So I think Bailey's it's over, it's a couple thousand dollar minimum order. Um, whereas AA Vineyards and Coldstream had a much lower amount you needed to get. Um, but if you just search woody ornamental plants, a lot of what is being sold is more for um, either uh, restoration work, um, uh, like stream stabilization kind of stuff, um, less so sold for for kind of the floral arrangement side of things that we've been talking about. But these were the ones that we found. Um, and um, I would just mention in, with uh, the planting stock, uh, Bailey's in particular has a, a Bailey's red twig dogwood. So they've bred that to have this really vibrant red color. Um, that is uh, patented or copyrighted. I don't know exactly what the terms are for that, but if you plant that, you can't, um, you're not allowed to cut that and then and then propagate it yourself. Um, whereas some of the more, uh, I guess, generic kind of varieties, you can do that. Um, so those were kind of like what we did with the local cuttings. Um, AA Vineyards, we all got the, un the unrooted um, cuttings and those worked really, really well. We were really happy with the, that product. And then the Coldstream was the rooted cuttings. And then 
Um, I've been doing some outreach with local florists to kind of identify what the what the the market interest is in these uh, products and specifically what varieties and, and quantities and things like that. And so I, I want to just mention that there is um, from a survey we did with some florists, these were kind of the top uh, five um, varieties that were of interest, red twig, dogwood, pussy willow, curly willow, um, birch, cuttings, and winterberry. Um, and you often see the kind of birch um, dogwood arrangement with some um, like evergreen, like spruce uh, cuttings too in a lot of the winter um, potted uh, floral arrangements like in, within municipalities and stuff. So that's what uh, I wanted to talk about just to get started and give some background on the project. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Molly, who's gonna talk about um, what they've been doing at a collective. Great, thanks Jake. Let me share my screen. Did that work? Yep. All right, wonderful. And you can hear me fine and yep. see the screen. Wonderful, okay. As Jake said, my name is Molly Schindler and I am one of two main operators at Ecollective Farm. So my farm partner is Derek Roller and we have, between the two of us, pretty defined um, divisions of labor on the farm. So I head up cut flowers and thus the Willow Project falls under my scope of work. Uh, but the farm beyond cut flowers were 51 acres in Mechanicsville. So that's in Cedar County, like I said, and we're just, our farm is located between Tipton and Mechanicsville. Um, we have about 20 tillable acres on the farm. So in a typical year, we cultivate anywhere from 10 to 15 of those acres in diversified vegetables for the most part. But then we have woodlands that surround the farm on three sides and we do shiitake mushrooms in the woods. Uh, we grow quite a bit of seed garlic at the farm that we sell to other farms in the northern United States. Farms in Alaska have bought our seed garlic and farms in Maine have bought our seed garlic and everywhere in between. And then also cut flowers. So that's how we fill up our 10 to 15 acres every year. And our main markets to sell all of these products into are mostly in Iowa City and Cedar Rapids and uh, include a 150 person CSA this year, um, sales to New Pioneer Co-ops and also Gary's, which is a local uh, grocery store in Mount Vernon. We sell to local restaurants. In previous years, we've sold at the Iowa City and Cedar Rapids farmers markets depending on the year. And this year we're selling at the online farmer's market with Iowa City. And then we also sell to our local food hub, which is the Field to Family Food Hub. So we have quite a few different ways that we uh, get our food out into the community, which is our main mission is to grow food that nourishes people and the planet. And our vision is that that includes all Iowans, regardless of race, class, or geography, and that we just like to see everybody uh, have, ac have access to fresh, organically grown local food and um, hope that it be cultivated with consideration for clean water, breathable air, and healthy soil. So zooming in onto the cut flower operation, I grow on about a half acre and that includes three different growing spots. The main flower field, which is located at the farm in Mechanicsville, which you can see in the middle photo here. And I use a lot of ground cloth, which I'll talk about because I incorporated that into the willows that I planted. But here is the planting of foxglove that I planted. It's a biennial, so I planted it in 2019 and then it bloomed this year in 2020. And I think this was a picture from this year, early in the spring, and we were just um, putting some Hordenova netting 
that it could grow into so that the stems would be nice and straight. Um, so I grow on half acre at some of that's at the main flower field at Eco Collective, and then I also have a growing space where I live in Iowa City. So my house is in Iowa City and I live on a double lot. So my yard is a bit bigger and I've turned my whole yard into a little urban farm. And the picture on the far right here is of the greenhouse space at my spot in Iowa City. And there's snapdragons in the foreground and then closest to where I'm standing in the picture is Lizzie at this. And behind me there is some ginger that I was growing for our CSA last year. And then I also, when I planted the willows, the I planted 200, I planted three rows that are 200 feet that are out in the fields, uh, the vegetable fields at the farm. So that was for my scale, uh, a pretty large planting. And then additionally, we're in a conservation stewardship program. So that is a program through NRCS, so many acronyms, um, which is the National Natural Resource and Conservation Services. Did I get that right, Jake? Natural Resource and Conservation Services from the USDA. So it's a conservation program that our farm is in and a part of that is we're in the process of establishing a half acre of oak savanna prairie. Um, so it'll take a bit for that to grow and be in its full beauty, maybe about 2022, 2023, because we planted the seeds this year and prepped for that last year. Um, over the years, I've sold these cut flowers into a few different markets. I've sold, I started by selling at the Cedar Rapids market, farmer's market, um, have sold at the Iowa City market through our CSA um, and to uh, local florists. And then also have done a bit of designing flowers for special events. Last year I did uh, a wedding. Currently, my main markets are, we have, uh, or I have a 50% flower CSA, and that's offered as a part of our vegetable CSA. So we have 150 members in our vegetable CSA, 50 of those members chose to add on the flower CSA. So they pick up the flowers and they pick up their vegetables. And then I've sold a bit to the online Iowa City market, farmer's market this season, as well as we do a pop-up every week, it's just farmer's market style sale at my urban farm in Iowa City and I sell flowers there. Um, and over time I've sort of honed in and figured out that I really like um, knowing my customers and I enjoy the interacting with the people that I sell my product to and that's one of the main reasons I've honed in on CSA and farmers market sales. Um, but I am not opposed to changing my markets in the future and selling more to florists again. Um, knowing a bit about how um, the cut flowers look at our farm, uh, uh, obvious question is how do the willows fit into the cut flower vision? Uh, as I farm longer. I'm in about my seventh season of growing cut flowers and I started on a super small, very micro scale and I've really taken my time to scale up to a half acre. Uh, more and more I realize how important it is to work smarter, not harder, which is a very common phrase. And for me, I understand more and more the power of perennials and biennials um, anything that you're going to plant at a time of year that isn't as busy. Our farm, how it's structured, we just have very busy springs. We have about three acres of asparagus that has to be picked every single day starting in mid-May through the end of June. So that is also the time when you are planting things in the spring in Iowa, such as annual flowers. So our busiest time of year is when I'm also supposed to be planting annual flowers. And thus, I've recognized how nice it would be 
to have a little bit less to plant in terms of annuals and move toward having more perennials. So the willows are great for that. They're also, as Jake said, available at a time when our cash flow is um, at its lowest point of the year and it's a gap in production. Um, so that they fit nicely in that early spring window of like March to May uh, harvest. And then also I'm really interested in how they can be dried and used throughout the season. Um, curly willow and pussy willow, which I chose to plant, um, have a lot of potential for different value added. I've dabbled with wreath making and doing just different projects with dried flowers. This year I uh, scaled up my dried flower production. So I'm really curious to see in the future just how willows might fit into value added as well. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through, the next few slides are gonna be propagation of the willows, the site prep, and then the planting. So I, this project started last season. I got cuttings to propagate uh, from a local farmer last March. So Jess Kettler, who lives in the area, she owns a property that has a lot of willows on it. She didn't plant them, but the woman who did plant them happens to be a CSA member. And she owns a local business, Moss. It, uh, Moss formal, formerly did a lot with uh, flowers and willows. So Anne had planted all of those, but then sold the property and she shift the, shifted the business a bit. Um, but I think my hope in purchasing local was twofold. So in choosing to purchase my cuttings from Jess um, locally, I was hopeful that the varieties would be a bit more adapted to our specific Eastern Iowa region. Um, I guess the best example I have is more from the vegetable side of farming, but often we'll grow out, grow certain seeds that you know, in the catalog that they come from, they, they say that like this cabbage is the best late, late spring cabbage that are, you know, late summer cabbage that you can harvest. It's phenomenal. And then we'll grow it and we'll find that another variety actually does better in our region. And then we'll hear from other farmers that they've experienced the same thing. So it's just hard. Our work is so, so place-based that I thought, well, if I get these cuttings from another farm where it, close to me, where they've really thrived, they should, in theory, um, also do well at my farm. Um, I also saw it as an opportunity to just keep the money that I was spending on the cuttings in the local economy. I asked my customers to do that when they buy flowers or food from me, and um, our farm tries as much as possible to consider um, to really consider every purchase in terms of all the aspects of how big the company is we're buying from, where they're located, um, how they treat their workers, et cetera. So I just preferred to um, buy those cuttings locally and build that relationship with our CSA member and then also with Jess. Um, so I bought the six different varieties of cuttings from Jess. Three of those were different varieties of pussy willow. One, they were there was like a giant, a medium, and a small. And then I also uh, purchased three different types of willow. Ones you can see in the picture, the red is the flame. And then there was a green curly and a yellow curly willow. And I chose to root those cuttings before planting and I think the biggest factor thinking back was timing. So I received those cuttings from Jess in late March, but I couldn't plant until May because it's Iowa. It's too cold outside in April. And so I just held them in this tray, planted them about five to nine to a little four inch pot and held them in there until May. And they grew, this is the, the day I planted them, I think, um, but they grew nice roots and started sprouting foliage by the time I was transplanting them out in May. 
So the site prep, how we chose where to grow the willows. It wasn't super uh, complicated process. Uh, Derek was really interested in the willows, thinking about how they might function within our uh, annual vegetable crop fields as a windbreak in some areas that uh, are not close to any windbreaks. So um, he had interest in that. And we picked one of our fields that we thought would be a good site and tilled it up. And as Jake pointed out, you can still see some dandelions there. It was just a quick rough till. And part of the reason for that is because I was using a lot of, as you can see here, this roll of ground cloth. So I was gonna end up covering a lot of the soil anyway, and it didn't need to be, um, we didn't need to kill back all the weeds. Would have been nice to, but we didn't have to. Um, planting, we rolled out the, the ground cloth. So in that last slide, you saw a big six foot roll of ground cloth and we rolled that out. And you can see Derek here is planting a willow on one side of the six foot ground cloth. And behind him in the photo, which you can't see is another row of willow. And then what we did after this whole row, 200 feet was planted as we rolled out a three foot roll on this side. If I had to go back, I would just make that a six foot roll because the willows have already grown so big. I think I'm gonna have to put in a six foot roll um, either over that three foot roll or take that three foot roll up, use it elsewhere on the farm and roll out a six foot. Um, we did a single foot spacing right in row in between the two ground cloth, ground cloths. And then in between all of the willows, they were generally planted at about three feet um, distance from each other in row. And I did experiment a little. Um, there's a nice book that Jake got for some of us participating in this uh, grant. And it said you could plant willows anywhere from one to six feet distance. And there are pros and cons for the whole range of choices. Three foot really seemed like the right distance for what I'm wanting. And I played a little bit with planting a few closer together at the ends of the row. And then I did have some plants die off. So there are plant there are a few that are spaced more six feet apart. So I'll get to see what happens when these willows are planted one foot apart, three foot apart, six foot apart. Um, and then the tool I use for planting is a hor hori hori. It's my favorite tool on the farm. You can uh, weed as you go as you're planting. Um, it also has a spade that's about six inches long. So with the willows, they're these sticks, right? So you plant them pretty deep in the ground and the hori hori worked great for that. Um, those willows have been growing since last May and for the most part they're pretty happy. I have had um, some challenges, one of those being as you can see in the one photo Japanese beetles uh, are loving to eat some of my willows, the ones that are smaller. And then we've also had some deer pressure on some of the willows. One row is doing way better than the other two rows. And I have ideas of why that might be, but I, I don't know exactly. Um, other things to point out, we mulched all the willow. Um, that helped with weed pressure. Even then, I still had to weed quite a few times last year and then at least twice this year. And if I had to go back and redo this whole process, um, I'm going to go back a slide. So oftentimes, I'm going to go back a few slides. As you can see here, I burned holes in this landscape fabric to plant this foxglove. And if I had to go back, Rather than planting in between two rolls of landscape fabric, I would just burn circular holes in a single row of landscape or single roll of landscape fabric 
and plant the willow directly into that space. And I think that would help a ton with weed pressure and just cut down the, on the amount of time that I've had to spend on weeding, which is always ideal. Um, I think for me, that is, that's mostly everything I have to say. Well, like when you, when you weed, are you you're hand weeding or are you using a string trimmer or something like that? Well, the last time I weeded, I, I let the weeds get way too established. So I did have to hand, uh, hand weed. Earlier in the spring when I weeded, I was spot weeding because the um, straw mulch at that time was suppressing the weeds in a way that was really good. So I just went down the row and it was, it was me and one other person and it didn't take us very long. And if, we, if, if I had just stayed on top of that, which is the ideal, right? Um, it would have been fine. This last time it, it took me quite a while to weed the three rows. Yeah. And part of that was I just let the weeds get away from me. But knowing that the weeds always get away from me, no matter what, uh, that is why I think if I went back, I would choose to just plant directly in, into the ground cloth. Because there's always going to be years where you forget about something or something goes wrong in another area and you just can't attend to the willows and all of a sudden it's a week later and the weeds are just out of control. Yeah. So, yeah. Weeding is a challenge. Yeah, and we had a couple mm -hmm. other growers. I, mean, I, I think people choose to, chose to do the weed management in different ways. Some people just, if they had an existing kind of grass area, they just tilled a four or five foot strip and just planted into that with landscape fabric on top and left the grass there and just figured they'd mow the grass. Um, others actually just only kind of either dug a hole or used a, like a post, um, a post hole auger and just dug up some soil into a grassy area and just planted right into that and then just mowed that entire area. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, which of those options kind of worked uh, well and worked you know, maybe not have worked as well. Yeah, I would be interested. Did anybody do, did Anne do a larger scale than me from Pheasant Run? Um, I think it's probably pretty similar. And do you know how she um, planted? I'll listen to, I mean, I should just attend the webinar and then I'll know <laughs> that's upcoming, but. Um, yeah, so. Because I think scale is a big, scale is always, Systems of your farm always play a role in what you decide, and there's no single one best way to do it. But I am curious, other people on this scale, how they choose to manage they, weeds and plants. So they did. Um, they planted into a a previous fescue grass mix field, and then they used mostly potted or all potted plants. Um, they tilled the area um, a total of 375 row feet. So pretty similar to yours, mm -hmm. a, a little bit more. Um, and then they use landscape fabric, two foot wide landscape fabric with holes uh, cut into it. And then they put wood chip mulch. Yeah, they knew. <laughs> Anne's been at it longer than, than I have. She, she knew. <laughs> Just put it right into the landscape fabric. This was my learning moment. Yeah. That's okay. That's it's only fun. 600 feet. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I um, wanted to just have one last slide here. The, this is the book that Molly mentioned. Um, it's called Woody Cut Stems for Growers and Florists. I, it's, it's like the Bible for this production, I think. Um, it really is super thorough. It's one of those books where the first half-ish is, maybe even more, is just general production. And then the second chunk of the book is all just um, species by species, um, uh, plant spacing, um, the best varieties, um, all kinds of stuff about specific production. Um, it's a really incredible book um, by Lane Greer and John Dole, and it's um, $70.
but it's a thick, it's probably three or 400 pages. Um, and it's uh, the American Specially Cut Flower Grower Association, or maybe it's Association of, anyway, um, ASCFG.org, they have them available there. Um, they had a, they had the, um, the publisher do a, another printing of the book here recently and they still have books available. Um, and then here's our contact information, um, Molly and mine, if you wanna get in touch with us. And then uh, before we take questions, if you all have any, I wanted to just mention, um, we are doing another webinar on September 13th. It's another Sunday afternoon um, at 2 p.m. And that's with uh, the Franzenbergs at Pheasant Run Farm. They're in Van Horn, another uh, farm that we're partnering with in this project. And um, Calvin Franzenberg is gonna be leading us on, um, on a discussion about the uh, kind of the, the marketing aspect of thing. How do you, the post-harvest handling, harvesting, um, and then marketing. Um, and we'll be joined by a, a florist or two as well to talk from their perspective. So that's September 13th uh, at 2 p.m.